So I'm so happy that we got the definition of our theme tonight from the Heritage Council of Ireland because many of you may not know, but um, Koreans have been called the Irish of the East for a long time. Uh, the Wall Street Journal once asked an Irish ambassador, what's that about? And he explained, well, when you think about it, they're both small countries that really fiercely held on to their traditions over centuries despite having powerful neighbors and being buffeted by them. England for Ireland, Japan for Korea. But for me, I like to think about the fact that Irish people and Koreans like to socialize by going to pubs to drink, that they get into fights really easily, but then they forgive pretty quickly. And they're also very quick to laugh as well as to cry. Now, I was born in Houston, Texas in 1967 to immigrant parents who came to the US without even the money for their airfare. But they did come with education that would lead to a more prosperous future. My dad was a doctor in Korea, so he was a foreign medical graduate, or FMG. And um, when I was in college, I happened to take a course on the history of medicine. And it turned out that as part of that course, we talked about the history of how FMGs were treated in this country. And in, for a long time, they were prevented from getting licenses to practice medicine here. That all changed in the 19, late 1950s in the era of specialization. What happened was there was a big concern that with all these specialists, there wouldn't be enough general practitioners to take care of patients. And there was even a committee that predicted within a few years we'd run out of doctors unless we allowed FNGs to become doctors. So my dad directly benefited from that policy. And I remember as a teenager at, looking at this board in Mercy Hospital in Des Moines, Iowa, they had pictures of all the staff. And you can imagine the older doctors were all uniformly white. But as you got to the age of middle age, what, where my dad was, all of a sudden there was all this diversity, like delegates to the United Nations or something. So anyway, growing up in Houston, Texas, today I think we all think of it as a fairly cosmopolitan city, but it was actually pretty different in the 60s and 70s. And I remember suffering through a number of racial humiliations. I was called yellow. And that's actually the word that's on my Texas birth certificate for race or color. Um, the, I was, you know, got all these taunts, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees, all those kinds of things. And then just as Houston was getting more diverse, my family moved to Iowa, an even more homogeneous place. So by the time I went to college, I actually assumed my wife was going to be white. And it wasn't like this burning desire to have a white woman as my wife. It was just, it was hard to imagine being married to someone other than the 99% of people who surrounded me. My parents didn't even bother saying, why don't you find a nice Korean girl? And yet, <laughs> I ended up getting married to a Korean American, and get this, from South Dakota. <laughs> so, now we have twin girls, and we live in New York City, and we had to make some choices. You know, they, we actually had the option of language school, you know, Korean language school, which wasn't an option for my parents when I was growing up in Houston. But we decided not to do that. But we had to ask ourselves, well, what does it mean to be a second generation Korean? And like a lot of minorities, we instilled our shared values in our children. Uh, we spent time with both sets of grandparents, even though they were very far away. I'm not great with Korean language, but we learned how to cook Korean food at home, and we also ate out a lot in K-Town. And then we also instilled um, some values that come from Confucianism. You know, th this kind of um, respect for the elderly, the uh, respect for harmony and modesty. And we would always emphasize, you know, not being impressed by show-offs and trying to be humble in your occasional achievements. But that brought me to schooling. And I have to say, there was, um, there's a relatively famous woman, Amy Chua, a Chinese-American, who wrote about being a tiger mom, which I found to be a little bit offensive, personally, because it seemed to promote this racist trope of the model Asian minority, all for her financial gain. But that being said, I think every Asian recognizes that 
kind of parenting. And I would say my own parents um, probably did a milder form of it. And they certainly emphasized like becoming a doctor and getting good grades. So when we were raising our kids, it was kind of like, well, what are we going to do? And one of the things I wanted to avoid was that whole perpetuation. So we didn't emphasize becoming a doctor or lawyer. We didn't emphasize getting good grades. However, we would just kind of try to support them. We told them, just do your best. But then they recently both got into Harvard. And I asked them, OK, well, what was it like growing up in our family? And they said, oh my god. It was so much pressure. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me? I didn't even know what courses you were taking. I didn't ever check your homework. You don't understand pressure you know, like I had. And uh, they were like, yeah, you just said to do our best. But we knew that really meant get straight A's. <laughs> so I told my friends I surpassed Amy Chua and her heavy-handed tactics where she's like sitting on her kids' shoulders, checking what they're doing. I get to do my own thing, but my kids act like I'm on top of them, so I've come to call that ninja parenting. <laughs> so then, you know, what does all this mean about me? You know, after all, I did become a doctor, but the fact is it doesn't, didn't quite follow my parents' program. Uh, lately, I've become more and more entrepreneurial. I work in biotech. And in the last five years, I've had five different jobs at five different companies. Not the stable career that my parents were envisioning. And then worse yet, I do extracurriculars like this. Um, I'm a performing violinist. I recently debuted at Carnegie Hall. I play in a chamber orchestra. I do stand-up comedy. I've been doing that for about a year. I, I perform at the comic strip in Manhattan. And uh, I took up singing during the pandemic and now hang out singing in Brandy's Piano Bar with a bunch of Broadway singers. Not anything that my parents would have condoned. But I do think that I've been able to build on the foundation of my culture and expand it to other possibilities. Increasingly, when I am working in these companies, for the time that I am, uh, I'm in leadership positions. and. One of my good friends is an executive coach and has observed me in various circumstances and tells me that I practice a form of leadership called empathetic leadership, which she says is the hardest kind of, of leadership to, uh, to do, but it also leads to the highest performing teams. Uh, I, I like to think that comes from my Confucianism. And one of the things that people who work for me say is that while we while you, we think you're a nice guy, it's also very clear the very high standards you keep and the high expectations you have of us. So I kind of feel like that's, again, my ninja parenting. <laughs> so anyway, um, I also think my love of music comes from my culture. And you know, I, I'll never forget that I went to Korea many years ago, shortly after being married, got introduced to my wife's extended family. We had this huge dinner, maybe 30 people around the table, and I was shocked because all of a sudden at the end of the dinner, one of the elder members of the family started pointing to people one by one and made them stand up and sing a song, just like maybe the Irish would do. So on that note, I wish you all a good night. Thank you.